Welcome to the core at Westside Community Church. This is part three of Pastor John's message, Destroying the Destructive Cycle. Let's join him now as he begins. If uh, you got your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter four. Um, I want to welcome you tonight. I'm glad that you're here. Um, we're going to kind of work through probably half the verses probably to verse 15. So John chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 1 through 15. Tonight's going to be um, a Bible study. It's going to be uh, a chance for you to dig deep into God's Word. We want to find out what God is trying to say to us and how He's communicating that message. So um, you, will, you will see that very plainly as we work through. Uh, the outline is important just because I want you to have a place to take some notes, okay? Um, I always think it's good. I believe that we should be lifelong learners. If you don't see the value in that. You're missing out on what God wants to teach you, and there's different times he'll teach you. So, so we kind of give that to you, so you're welcome to take notes, kind of do that. Um, some people can't take notes because they got to listen. Some people got to just stay focused, and others want to write notes. Uh, no passing notes back and forth to each other tonight. Um, no jotting a question in the corner, like need to ask him afterwards where he got that cool sweatshirt. None of that stuff, okay? Um, that just stay focused on what we're doing. So, all right? Good deal. So John chapter 4, destroying the destructive cycle. For those of you who haven't been with us, um, on page one of your outline, I'm, I'm just going to do some quick review from last week and show you where we were at. Verse uh, 3 was the verse we began with last week from John chapter 4, and it said that Jesus uh, left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. And we talked about the fact that Judea was in the south, Galilee was in the north, and Samaria was directly in between the two of them. It would have been unusual for a Jew to travel through Samaria. Samaria is a pagan land. It's people who are without God, and you would have normally gone around it. You would have headed to the east and gone up next to the Jordan River. But, but the Bible clearly says here that Jesus left there and went back once more to Galilee. Do not uh, be alarmed by the person behind the curtain. So whatever that was back there. Um, uh, I, I, somebody's stalking me. Anyway, so... Um, but I want you to be aware that, I love the line, he went back once more. And we talked about that last week. Why would he go back once more? Because you matter to him. Think about it. It says he went back once more to Galilee. He constantly pursues us. And Job 36, 16 says that God is wooing us from the jaws of distress to a spacious place, free from restriction to our own table laden with choice foods. I know that's a heavy scripture but the first part is what I want you to understand. It says that God is wooing you. He lovingly calls you from the jaws of distress. Job 36, 16. Um, and it's a powerful verse to remind us. Why does he do that? Because he knows that we live in a dangerous world. And so Jesus went back once more. And, and then we, we've been working off what we call the destructive cycle. Now, this is not, um, this is not anything brand new. Uh, this is not my own material of sorts when it comes to the destructive cycle. Some people have four, some have, people have five circles. I, I'm, I think in threes, okay, so that's why I went to three. Um, and we looked at John chapter five last week, if you're not familiar with the story of the man at Bethesda at the pool. Uh, we saw all five uh, from a five circle cycle, and we also saw the three. Tonight I'm going to show you uh, this woman at the well, and I'm going to show you where she was, uh, the issue of where she was physically, there was social separation. We believe this, and I believe it to be true. That in our lives, there are the mind, body, and soul. That's how God made us. Uh, he made us with these three parts, the, the heart, mind, and soul. And, and that's uh, part of our creative order. And out of that, we've kind of uh, labeled that the heart has to do with our physical, the mind has to do with our emotional, and the soul has to do with our spiritual. And in the black here in the middle is largely what we're going to talk about with this lady. She was socially separated. She was psychologically shameful. And then there was, uh, she was spiritually sinful. And what I've been proposing to you as we look at this woman investigatively, that you will discover that this cycle is an operation in her life. My contention is simply this, that for a lot of us, we'll have one of these areas out of whack in our life, and we'll spend some time trying to fix it. But we feel pretty good about ourselves because the other two we're really doing great in. I mean, why would I even really worry about the one? I mean, I know it's off a little bit, but... But I'm okay in the other two. And we talked about you can be a spiritual elite. You can have all the scriptures of the Bible memorized. You can be physically uh, healthy, engaged in relationships. You do well with people. You're out there and you're about everything. But emotionally inside, you can have some shame issues going on. Psychologically, you aren't thinking right. You can have depression looming large in your life. 
And, and, and I'm here to believe and I'm here to tell you that don't let that pass. Don't let that slide. Deal with this because my contention is that if you don't deal with the, with the psychological shame in your life, the emotional dysfunction, it does lead uh, to one of these other um, two. And they're not always in order. They kind of float back and forth. So at the top of your uh, page, you'll see underneath the title I put down that the more you sin, the more shame you feel, the more separated you become. And the more separated you become, the more sin you, uh, you, you're involved in and the more shame you feel. And we see this destructive cycle begin to spin out of control. It is why we see somebody get their life together, right? You have friends, you have family members, maybe yourself. You've gotten your act together, you've gotten your life together together. And then a period of time goes by, and all of a sudden you fall off. You, you notice that friend who had their life together. They, they were doing everything right. All of a sudden just isn't functioning right, and you discover that something went wrong. And it doesn't have to be in the area where they were struggling before. So here's my own story. The reason why I love John chapter 4 is that I have always struggled here with social separation. I don't have uh, many issues when it comes to being spiritually sinful. Not that I am a angel. I mean, I know for some of you that's a shocker. Um, but, but in my life, my, I have a line of work which largely guards me against a lot of sin. I have a wife who largely guards me against a lot of sin. And I have a lot of responsibility that, that, that really presses upon me this need to keep that part of my life in check. So spiritually, over the last 25 years, that's not been real hard to kind of manage. Not to say the devil doesn't mess at the highest of levels to distract me and cause me to desire those things at times. I shouldn't say cause me to desire that. Uh, you, you, I desire those things. But what I'm getting at is this has always been in check. Emotionally, I don't have shame issues. I mean, my mind has been great. Emotionally, I've always been strong. I've had some solid issues uh, in my life placed there. I, I've, I've kept my stuff together upstairs, uh, been very solid emotionally. But this was always the issue. Socially, I separate. Even though I, I live a very public lifestyle, I like to separate. Um, I shared with some of you before that, that I uh, am constantly improving my home. I'm, I, you know, I do landscaping. I, I, you know, we buy furniture. We replace carpet. We tile things. We paint rooms. We, we do a lot of these things. And my wife is always saying to me, uh, now that we got the downstairs done, we ought to have some people over. I mean, you know, wouldn't it be great? And I'm like, no. I don't want that at all. I don't. I, I don't. Uh, hardly anybody has ever really been to my house. Um, I have a beautiful home. Our home is beautiful. Uh, but that's my uh, haven. That's my safe place. Because I socially separate. I, I want to pull away from things. I, I hide because of some brokenness in my heart. There's some things physically where I pull away from relationships. I do well in these relationships here. I love those of you who are here. I love this church. I love people I meet. I was at uh, Tom's today, and, and I was getting stamps, and the lady behind the counter said she was with us on Sunday morning for the first time, and, and I loved engaging with her. Um, I have no problems with that. But given the opportunity to run away and hide, I will do that. I pull away from those kind of things. So there's the social separation. Well, Lo and behold, guess what happened just a couple years ago as I'm discovering, as I'm working through some of my stuff? John Clark began to, this social separation began to leak into some emotional issues, and then there was this creation of some shame things, and um, this depression and anxiety snuck in on me. Didn't even see it coming. Um, it, it, it largely seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, and uh, I've been working on that. And I shared with that a couple weeks ago on a Sunday morning that that's part of going to some counseling to get kind of this thing figured out here. Um, it's amazing how I never thought this would affect that. But lo and behold, it did. So you see how the cycle begins to spin? If I don't begin to monitor this and I don't figure out why I want to separate so much, we're going to have issues. So guess what? In the meantime, while I'm working on some depression and anxiety issues, I got to go back up here and find out why I socially separate, why I pull myself away from relationships. So... There it was. That was nice transparency. I just decided to tell you who I was. All you're like, I knew I didn't like him. I knew I didn't like him. I knew there was something wrong with him. Uh, and we all come to your house? Uh, no, no. I actually did invite somebody from this room to my house, and I'll give you $5. You can guess who it is by the end of it. And they've only been in my house one other time. Um, and uh, so there, there's a second time. Chuck, you've known us for years. Have you, hang on. Are you trying to guess? Yeah, Michelle's one of the people I'm invited to my house. Um, Chuck, you, you, you've known, uh, we've known each other 25 years. Have you ever been to my home? Okay. How many times? 
Thank you. Chuck helped build my house, and he's never been invited back since. I don't say, I, should, I shouldn't say, I don't say that with great pride anymore. I, I know there's something wrong with that. I know there's something about me that's broken that doesn't um, want anybody to come into that little safe haven. It's my nest. It is the weirdest thing in the world. Um, I wish there was something wrong with it so I could tell you, well, you can't come to my house because there's water damage everywhere or it smells like feet. I mean, it's not that. Uh, my house is pristine clean. I'm a nut about that. Um, it has to do with some issues up here with the heart. So we're working on that. So my desire tonight is not to so much tip my hand to you and tell you what's wrong with me as much as I hope God uses it to poke away at your own self and realize maybe what's wrong with you. And that we just don't settle there, right? Let's not do that. Let's not just say, okay, there it is. That's what's wrong with me and I'm not going to do anything about it. Why don't we work on it? Why don't we, why don't we fix that? Why don't, why don't we get this stuff right in the heart? Why don't I work on my, my issues in my mind? Why don't I keep check on my soul? Why, and if I can fix it, I can destroy the destructive cycle. I mean, lo and behold, John Clark might be a healthier person. And then if I'm healthier, you might become healthier. And if I'm healthier, my kids might become healthier. And my relationships would be healthier. Our world could be impacted. This community could be impacted if we were healthier people in every area of our life. Here's what happens to Christians, Okay is that this is all we ever seem to work on when you come here. When you come to church, we're only dealing with the spiritual. That's why you bring your Bibles, and that's why you, you like the idea that I talked tonight about a Bible study, because there it is. I'm going to work on the spiritual part of it. But these are connected folks. How God created you, they're connected. And so as you work on the spiritual, you better be checking what's going on with the physical and what's happening with the emotional. As the soul is improved, you better check the heart and the mind also. But we normally don't do that. Because when we come here, we play Christianese, we play the game, we fake it and, and as, as, as long as we can. A lot of you love Westside because on Sundays, you only have to be here for about an hour. Whew, I can do that. I can hold it together. Honey, smile, and we walk into church. Kids don't tell anybody what it's like at our house. And we make it for an hour, and then we go back home because we just work on the spiritual. I guarantee you there's some other issues that are um, at play. Okay? So that's where we've been. If you want to, we'll pray and then allow you to leave um, during that time. Or do you want to stay and keep working on your stuff? Good. All right, excellent. I wanted to hear that. Okay, so there, there's the outline there for that. So then look, look down your outline there. Verse 4, we're going to move to verse 4. This is all brand new stuff from, from, uh, that we haven't covered. So verse 4, John chapter 4 says this. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. I just want to stop there because I love it that it says he had to go through Samaria. Remember I told you he didn't have to go through Samaria? Judea is in the south, Galilee is in the north. Yes, it's a straight line up through, um, through Samaria, but Jews didn't go there. I mean, they went around to the east up by the Jordan River. But this says Jesus had to go through there. Why did he have to go through there? Because somebody there needed him. And I love it that it doesn't stop him from getting to us. He does not care what roadblocks you put up. He doesn't care what walls you build. He will get to you. He has to get to you. It is his heart and his passion to come in contact with you. He had to go through Samaria because there was somebody there. This is not an issue of geography. It was an issue of the spiritual, the emotional, and the physical. He knew there was a woman there. Um, I love that it's the only story in John chapter four, it's the only person, uh, one person that he was going after, this one woman. A woman that most of us wouldn't have cared about. As we get her story in the coming weeks, you'll find she's the kind of woman we probably would have avoided. But he had to go through Samaria for her. Praise God that he had to come through here for you and I. Praise God that he found us. Praise God he found me at age 14 in a little church uh, just a few miles from here. Praise God he had to go through there because a broken-hearted little boy was sitting in a Sunday school class one morning, and it may have very well been one of the last Sundays I would have probably ever went to church. I was beginning that life of alcohol at 14, watching my two older brothers uh, drink and, and, and get involved in a lot of other stuff, and I was heading that way. It was a foregone conclusion, but Jesus had to go through Lake Ann for this one boy sitting at a table in a Sunday school room, and he found me, and I, I'm so thankful that he saw the value in me. I'm so glad he saw the value in every one of you. I'm so glad that he had to go through where you were at. Praise the Lord for that. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, a verse from last week. And the proof of that is this says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was what? What's the blank? Lost. 
So fill it in. What was lost? He came to seek and to save what was lost. There was something lost, and not just that you were lost, but something that was lost in us. He, he, he will look for that. That's why he came. So now look at verses 6, 7, and 8 at the bottom of your sheet, page 1, and then we're going to flip the page. It says this, Jesus was tired, don't turn yet, uh, from the journey and sat down by Jacob's well. It was about the sixth hour when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Don't turn. I want to talk about two things in there, and we're going to go to the next page, and we'll set up for a while. Jesus was tired. It is um, the only place in Scripture where I read where it says he was tired. He was deeply anguished when he was in Gethsemane, but I don't read any other place where it says Jesus was tired. Um, I wonder what he was tired of. I wonder what he was tired from, right? It says that Jesus was tired from the journey and sat down by Jacob's well. Um, There's proof, again, why he had to go through. He's willing to sit down. He's willing to wait for you. Um, he is where you are. He sat down by Jacob's well. He sat down in advance of her arrival. He is where you are. If you are here, he is here. He got here before you did in anticipation of you. Uh, I'm that kind of person where if I have a meeting with you, if I have an appointment, I'm going to be early. I can't be late. It drives me crazy to be late. Uh, I absolutely go out of my mind. I have to be early. Why? I think it matters, and so I will get there early. I like that about Jesus, too. He, he got there, and she wasn't there yet, so he sat down by Jacob's well, and he waited. Um, he'll wait for you. If it takes you a while to get around to an area of your life that needs to be worked on, if emotionally you've been trying to hide from him and slip him, don't worry. He'll wait for you. He'll just sit down and wait. Believe me, the beauty about Jesus is that he will outlast you every time. You understand you're irresistible, and irreplaceable to him. Um, there's nothing that stops him from loving you. Um, so he will wait. He will wait. I, 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 I still like the first three words, and I also am confused. Jesus was tired. Let's see if we can't answer that in the weeks to come. So flip your page. We're already on to page two. This is a great day in John Clark's life. I don't know that I've ever went this fast through material in my life. Break. Let's just take a break, because this is beautiful. All right, now we're going to jump in the deep end of the pool. I want to work through some scripture here that will be very helpful for you tonight. We're going to talk about she was socially separated. Right up here, is the, this, this is our, um, that's a star. This is where we're going to spend our time tonight looking at her. We're going to do a little, a little clinical work and try to figure out the social separation for her. And I think you'll see it and you may just identify with it. And as we said in weeks before, if you're visiting us tonight and you're here, um, we're talking about your neighbors. We're talking about a spouse who's not here. We're talking about your mom. You don't have to look at yourself necessarily, but it doesn't hurt to maybe see that you're in this story. So verses 6 and 7, I broke it down a little bit more uh, on page 2. It says that it was about the sixth hour when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, when, and Jesus was tired from the journey. He sat down by Jacob's well, and again, I repeat the middle part, and then he says to her, uh, will you give me a drink? Do me a favor real quick, just do this. Circle the words, will you? It's, it's the last words of verse 8 there when Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Just circle the words, will you, because we're going to come back to that. This is interesting when he says, will you? Give me a drink, okay? But let's go back up to the top. It was about the sixth hour, um, and, and, and below that verse, you see a couple blanks there. Um, does anybody know what time the sixth hour was? Noon, okay. So the first blank there is, she was going to the well at noon. It was the sixth hour, not at sundown, which is the twelfth hour. There's your two blanks. Uh, she was going to the well at noon, which is the sixth hour, not at sundown, which is the 12th hour. Why is that so important? Why, remember, details are wonderful. Scripture, Jesus didn't just have John pen things just because it was, he had time to pass. Details are critical. It tells us clearly it was about the sixth hour. It was about noon when she went to draw water, not at sundown. And what, why did I want you to know that? Because listen, in this culture, in this area, in Samaria, you can even do it tonight. Go home and, 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 and Google the weather channel and, and find out what the temperature is like in Samaria right now. It's 100 to 120 degrees there. At noon, between, between the hours of 11 and 3, and the, that's the hottest part of the day. And she's going to draw water. But it was, it was typical, it was customary 
to go and draw water at sundown, at the 12th hour, after the sun had set. Temperature's still probably in the 80s, okay? But the sun is, is, is set. It is customary for it to be a woman's job. Women would go to draw the water. It was also known as a little coffee clutch, a little gossip thing, you know? And so she's not going when the other women are there. Does anybody know uh, the story well enough to just give us a little highlight what kind of woman is this woman from Samaria? What's a little background? Just give us a quick one-liner we can stick on a T-shirt to tell us about this woman. Johnny, what, what, what do we know about her? She liked men. She liked men. <laughs> like, that's a good T-shirt. I like men. I don't. I don't. But I mean, if that's a, that's a T-shirt we're designing. It, yeah, okay, yeah, that was bad, but you're exactly right. She liked men. How many men do we know that she liked? Several. How, how many husbands has this woman had? Micah? She's had five husbands, married and divorced five times. And is she single right now when she comes to the well? No, it says that she is with another man. Now, what do we know? Uh, Did anybody know the historical thing when Scripture tells us about that she is, and she is with another man? Is this man her husband that she's with? No. What else do we know about this woman? Is this man that she's with, is he married? Yes. So she really can't show up at sundown with the other women when they go to draw water customarily because she may be present with the woman of the man that she's with now. She is that lady in the community that everybody talks about. She's been married and divorced five times. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Very good point. The the point was that she couldn't divorce in that culture. They would have divorced her. But by the assumption of this last comment that we're going to get into in the weeks to come, that she's with a married man, we're assuming that potentially life has spun her out to this point. Not saying that the first one was her fault, the first marriage and divorce. Not saying the second one. But there is something, a pattern starting. And so now we begin to see this, very good point, Joan. We begin to see this social separation with this woman that she is pulling away. She is going at the hottest time of the day, uh, but she's not going when the other women are there. Because I imagine that this was the one they talked about when they went at sundown. Um, This is the one that everybody snickered in and uh, scoured at. Um, uh, She's going at noon. I mean, uh, to me, that is, um, it's difficult to imagine that just to get some water, you would have to go alone. Now, let, let me go one step further. The next line down, let's do the next blanks here because I want you to see this. She was drawing water from Jacob's well, okay? And Jacob's well was located outside the city walls. So she was drawing water from Jacob's well and it was outside the city walls. How do we know this? Excavations and, and uh, archaeologists have done the digs. The place where she was at, Jacob's well, was located in what's called Sychar, Samaria, which is S-Y-C-H-A-R, Sychar, uh, Samaria. That's where Jacob's well was at, and it is outside the city walls of Sychar. Why is that so critical for us to understand? Uh, Were there no wells inside Samaria, the village of itself of Sychar? Yeah, there was actually seven wells. Uh, But she was going to a well outside the city walls, Um, Jacob's well. Here's what's so critical about this. She is outside the safety of the protection of the walls provided by her city. Why did, why, did, why did communities back then have walls around their cities? Because they were trying to protect themselves against invading armies or other forces. But she ain't afraid to go outside the walls to grab water at noon. And she's going to Jacob's well. What is so critical about Jacob's well? Verses 11 and 12 from John chapter 4 tell us what Jacob's well was all about. Jacob's well is not the well where you go to get drinking water. Jacob's well is the well where you go to get water so you can feed your sheep and your goats and your lambs. It is a shepherd's well. Jacob being a shepherd, and you'll see as we work through, and we'll get to verses 11 and 12, she is going to draw water from a place that you wouldn't normally go draw the water from. Now, is she a shepherd? Is she tending a flock? We don't know, but I doubt it. For her, I imagine it was just easier to go outside the city walls. Who cares if you get abducted? I mean, really, at this point in her life, the social separation has led her away from the seven wells that it would be easy to go to. But why go there? If you're going to pull away, separate, you're going to socially separate, she's going to go out there, and she's going to go to a well that you don't go and draw water from on your own. 
Understand this. Shepherd's wells normally had a bucket that would hold anywhere from five to seven gallons of water. Anybody seen a five-gallon pail? You've seen how big a five-gallon pail is. Do yourself a favor tonight just to get, get a little used to this. Uh, and we know from verses 11 and 12, it's, she said that the well is deep in verse 11. It's a deep well. Okay, so there's a five-gallon pail. Fill it up with water um, and, and uh, tie a rope to it and get up on your roof tonight and just try to pull that up if you don't mind. Just see... Make sure the roof doesn't have snow or ice. Oh, that's right. It's March here in Michigan. It wouldn't happen. Yet. Yes, Miss Linda. Uh, no, it was a woman's customary thing. The women would go and draw the water, part of a social structure. Could, could very well have been that men might have been there. Yeah, could have been. I doubt at noon because that's when they were taking their siesta. But the reality is, why do the women gather to do the water? Because uh, they work together on it. But I don't think any women would be at this well anyways. She's out there by herself trying to pull up a five-gallon pail of water just to get something, if it's completely full. I mean, this just seems so weird. Why would you do that? Why, why would you go out of your way, risk your life, go to a place that you don't normally draw water from if it was for drinking, and, and, and have something that would be nearly impossible to pull up? Was there a question right there? Bill? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. She, she's on her own. And you, know, you said she's a social outcast. I mean, that's why I say when you look at her, we see physically she is socially separated. I mean, she's out there on her own because I believe of this brokenness in the heart. I mean, there's something wrong. I'm not trying to judge a woman. I, I, I want to just set the stage so we know who we're talking about as we move through the story. You get a better feel for her. And so there's all sorts of things happening here in her life. And, uh, and to be honest, my heart breaks because I wonder how many of us are going out of our way to avoid uh, contact with other humans. I wonder how many of us are um, taking risk that you normally wouldn't take to just avoid um, being in relationship. I wonder if, as we talked on week one, three weeks ago, if your past has caught up to your present because you didn't deal with your past. And because it, your past has caught up with your present, you're struggling in relationships with people because of what happened in your past. You gotta deal with those things, folks, because they will find you. Your past does catch up to you if you don't deal with it. And so here's this woman um, eking out a life. I can't imagine she's happy. Any, anybody sense that there may be joy in her life? I, I don't know that there would be. It's interesting, scripture doesn't tell us if she had children. It doesn't tell us if she had children with any of these relationships. Um, I gotta imagine there might be children involved. But nonetheless, you kinda get this real good clear picture that there's an issue going on with her. She is socially separated. She's alone um, at a well for shepherds in the middle of the day at the hottest time when you would customarily not draw water. So is that you? See, I've shared with you, um, not even realizing part of what I was sharing with you publicly, but I've done this uh, on Sunday mornings, that if I go to a sporting event for my children, like my boys play baseball, all three of them have played baseball, I am the father who sets uh, down first base or third base line and then back off about 20 feet. Now, I've been asked to do that at times because I'm a little loud and obnoxious at times, but, but I largely do that. I pull off this last year, my son John Michael played baseball, and I would pull off and I would set just at the edge of the parking lot, underneath a tree in a chair by myself. Um, away from the stands where everybody else is at. At, in, at different times, because I know so many people and so many people know me, they'd come over and talk, or I would go and engage between innings, but I wanted desperately to be as close as I could be to get away. Now, I don't have five husbands or wives, <clears throat> um, but I know there's something that was breaking in here, which was leading to what was going on here. Not even knowing that, you know, not even knowing why I pull off. I just, I thought I pulled off because I didn't want to be around people because I know so many people and I really want to watch my son's game. So that's what the excuse I was making. My, I wonder if she has an excuse here in her head that she's going there at noon because, you know, socially it's just too difficult to be around. Who knows? Let's look at verse 9. I, I want to keep moving through here. The Samaritan woman said, uh, now this is funny. Remember, remember, remember back up there, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Don't forget this. Will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, answering the question, will you give me a drink? You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then John the writer puts in parentheses, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. 
She didn't say that, but here's again John giving some editorial. Remember John chapter 5, there is not a verse what? What verse is missing from John chapter 5? Verse 4. Because again, John gives editorial in John chapter 5, verse 4. He gives editorial to the angels coming down and stirring up the water, the first one, and gets healed. And, 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 and the recorders of the scriptures pulled out verse 4 because they thought, hey, John, you don't need to give editorial. Here's more editorial they didn't pull out from him. I like that about John. He wants you to know why she would snap at Jesus when he asked, will you give me a drink of water? And she says, well, you're a Jew and I'm, I'm a Samaritan. She tried to shut him down right away, trying to push him away as far as he, he can. Does she know he's Jesus Christ, the Messiah, at this moment? Has no idea, does she? She has, she has no idea who he is. Um, but what is he? What is he to her? He, he's a man. What else is he to her? He's a Jew, right? She instantly, how does she know he's a Jew? Do, do Jews wear like the, the, the five poke star on their shirt? Uh, is there, is there, do they wear a shirt? Uh, I'm a Jew. How, how would she know he's a Jew? How, how would she, what has he said to her? Will you give me a drink? How, do, how does she know he's a Jew? Maybe instead of ordering for a drink? Yeah, because he's cheap. He's not going to pay for it. Is that what you're saying? Is this, is this some sort of racial slur? Is that what I'm hearing? Maybe they did. I think there's a good chance she recognized the accent. I think there's a good chance she looked at the tone of his skin. I think there's a good chance she could tell by how he dressed and what he wore. There, there's real good identifiers that he was probably, and she picked up on it real quick. She saw him coming, or he was actually waiting for her. She was coming. Uh, the reality is we don't know that she's drawn water yet. I don't believe she's drawn water. He's setting. Where is he setting? By Jacob's well. I don't know if he's setting on the well or he's just by it, but he's there. And this is that, oh my goodness, moment, right? I go out of my way at noon to go to the shepherd's well to draw some water, and there's a man. It, it, a man is there. I mean, this is the last thing I need. I don't need a man. And I like how she responds. She snaps right back. Samaritan women had sass. She says, how can you ask me for a drink? I mean, this is a sassy woman from Sychar. I mean, she's, she's definitely got her moxie. She doesn't want to put up with much. But I like how she says, how can you ask me? I, I, I wonder if, if, that's not a, if that's not a little, little picture into, into some uh, greater issues happening here with some psychological shame, which we'll talk about in the weeks to come. Because I think she was going a little further. I don't think it was just about the Jewish Samaritan thing. Um, I wonder if she's depleted. I wonder, I wonder if she's out. You know what I'm saying? I, I, want, I wonder if she's just saying, how can you ask me for a drink? Seriously, I mean, uh, I'm, 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 tired of, I'm tired of all this stuff. I mean, that's it's why I'm out here at noon. Just leave me alone. Let me just get my water and go back. I mean, she got nothing to offer probably. Um, she didn't want to be harassed by another man. Um, maybe stories have gotten around. Maybe they talk about her and men know she's that kind of woman. How does she know? I mean, she didn't know him to be Jesus yet. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a snap. But we do know that it is connected to the fact that Jews don't associate with Samaritans. But I think it goes deeper. Um, I wonder if her value um, is distorted to such a point where how can you even, even ask me for a drink? I mean, you can look at me and tell that I, I'm, I'm not the kind of woman you talk to. I mean, just move aside. Um, let me get my water, and we'll just go, and we'll just call it cool, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's probably happening here for her. So let's answer this question at the bottom, and then we're going to take a break. It's 743, and then we'll finish page three when we get back from the break. Jesus said, can you give me a drink? Is that what he said, can you? No, what did he say? Will you, right. Uh, can you, can, can she give him a drink? Yeah. Yeah, she can. She can give him a drink. She can do that. Can you? Yes, you can. Will you is a different thing, right? When he says, will you give me a drink, and, and go back and look at your original Greek wording, it is a specific word for the word will. And, in, and the word will actually has hyphenation based on the fact that he is referring to the fact from not will she physically give him a drink of water, but will she from her own soul. Is there anything left in you of your free will, of your ability to make a decision Forget that I'm a Jew and forget that you're a Samaritan. Will you do this? Is there, is there anything left inside of you 
that knows that you should be giving me a drink, not because I'm a man and because you're a woman, not because I'm a Jew and you're a Samaritan, but there is this moment of some free will Jesus is playing with. It's not can you, it's will you give me a drink? So what is wrong with the question? And here's some blanks I want you to fill in. We're gonna work through this real quick and we'll take the break. Uh, Jesus is a what? Man. Jesus is a man and she is a woman, right? There's your first two blanks. So you gotta see what's wrong with the question is number one, she, he's a man, she's a woman. That, that's where this begins. The, the second set of blanks, Jesus is Jewish, she is Samaritan. There's your second set of blanks. Just, just establishing now, not only do we have gender uh, out of the way that we're maybe dealing with, but we're also dealing with um, cultural. Then the third set of blanks, Jesus went out of his way to find her, and she went out of her way to be alone. Isn't that interesting uh, opposites there? Jesus went out of his way to find her. She went out of her way to be alone. Jesus said, give me a drink. I believe she said, give me a break. I just like how sassy she is, but I think there is in her, just seriously, leave me alone today. Jesus was different. He was offering living water. I believe she was desperate. She was living a lie. Jesus was different. He was offering living water, as you see, but she was desperate. She was living a lie. Let's stop there for a second. I want to talk about those. If you do any kind of a little study here, you'll begin to realize all those things are in play. Um, it's a gender issue. It's a cultural issue. It's an issue that he went out of his way to find her. She was going out of her way to be alone. Um, He's asking for a drink of water, but I really think she just wants a break. It's why she's out there alone. It's why she's socially separated. Don't you hate when you go out of your way to be alone and then somebody's there? Has that, has that ever happened to you? Do you ever, do you ever, do you ever go to your, 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 the secret place? Do you ever go to a spot where you can just be alone? You just need some time and somebody's there? Somebody needs you? Somebody, somebody wants you? Um, and then um, this is different. This living water thing, which we'll talk about after the break, is pretty huge. Uh, but she's living a lie. Um, she has no idea who she's messing with at this point. But I wonder if that's not part of our issue too. I wonder if you have no idea who you're messing with. I wonder if you have no idea who he is, who Jesus is. So she, she ran off the bat. Now we're going to see how this woman plays around with him, tries to avoid the obvious here she's contending, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. You're a man, I'm a woman. Um, but I wonder how many times we do that with him too. I wonder if you don't ever feel the Holy Spirit move in your life and he's calling you to action. He's calling you to respond to him. He's asking, will you? Will you, will you give up that addiction? Will you finally go back to reading my word every morning like you used to? Will, will you attend church regularly? Will you? begin to pray with your wife? Will you begin to show love and grace? Will you be merciful to other people? Will you stop talking like that? Will you stop watching those kind of movies? Will you? And I wonder how many times we don't realize who we're talking to or who's talking to us. Because I think a lot of times we live a lie and he's offering to us living water. He's offering to us life change and we're trying to find a way around it. The last set of blanks, and we'll take the break. Jesus was willing to help. Jesus was willing to help, and she was willing to be helped. She was, he was willing to help, and she was willing to be helped, with an E-D on the end. Jesus offered to her living water, and she accepted, she said, and I like verses 14 and 15, they're in green at the bottom. Jesus says, I will give you living water so you will never thirst again. And then she says, give me this water so I will never have to come here again. We're gonna look at verse 15 before we leave tonight. But I love her answer. Give me this water so I never have to come back here again. Good, so uh, page three, uh, we're gonna look at verses 10 uh, through verse 15. Um, Dave, can I get a napkin? I gotta get rid of my gum. Is there a napkin back there, buddy, at all? Oh, look, at Kyle's coming. Oh, Andy's coming up. You look like Kyle did when you first left there, and I thought Kyle was over there. Andy, thank you very much. No, I'm keeping it for later. Okay, thanks. <laughs> my mom would have took my gum from me. 
Stuck it behind her ear. Okay, here it is. Verse 10 says this on, on page three. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you uh, this living water. So stop there, verse 10. We're gonna stop right in the middle of the passage. I wanna work on that. I love what Jesus said. If you knew, if you had any idea the gift of God and who it is who asked for a drink of water. The reason why I love this and I want you to get it in your soul is do you know him? If you knew it was God, if you knew it was Jesus you were talking to, and the gift of God he has to offer, would you not just run with everything you have and say, absolutely, give this to me? So I say to you, same thing for you and I. If, do you know that he performs miracles? If you knew he performs miracles, then I promise you, you'd pray different. If you knew he repaired broken bridges for a living, then you would seek relationships differently. If you knew that he restores your soul, then you would enter into his presence differently. If you knew his grace was for all, then you would treat the brokenness in your life. If you knew his mercies were new every morning, then you would rise refreshed from a bad day before. If you knew, do you understand what I'm getting at? If you knew those things. But here's what happens. We know so little. We know so little is what I was just ranting about beforehand. Learn, read his word, dive into it deep. If you don't know how to study God's word, if you don't know how to do it, find some friends to study with. Find some. There are people in this room right now who are biblical scholars who scare me whenever I teach because they know more than I do. But it doesn't stop me from learning myself. It doesn't stop me from teaching. It doesn't stop me from digging. I like that part of it. There's somebody here tonight you can partner with. There's a couple people you can get involved. Go to gal time. Right now, Miss Diane is teaching some amazing stuff on the power of our words at gal time on Tuesday nights. I mean, there's life groups. There are Bible studies. Get involved with those. Get connected, but begin to grow. Because you've got you to know some things about him. If you knew uh, the gift of God and who it is that, that you're talking to, man, all the power we need, all um, the answers that exist are in him. They're in him. It's in Jesus. So imagine he, he leverages this. I like how Jesus says it when she says, you know, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How, you know, how do you, how do you ask me for a drink? And he said, well, if you knew, and I'm going to get back to gift of God, okay? I'm going to get back to what the gift of God is. And who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you this living water. It's interesting. Look at living water. The last two words in verse 10. Um, she's not heard this word before. I promise you, she's never heard living water. She's at a well uh, for animals, um, and he just said something, living water. He didn't say well water. He said living water. He didn't say water for animals. He said living water. He, there was something different, and, and this is what's interesting. It takes her a little bit to kind of get back around to what he just said. I wonder how many times Jesus has said something to you. I wonder how many times the Holy Spirit has spoken to your life something that was just a little different. And you didn't catch it the first time. You didn't catch what he was getting at. You didn't catch why he was asking you to forgive your mother-in-law for what she said at Christmas. You didn't understand what was going on there because that was foreign. You'd, ne you'd never felt that way before. But how do you know that if you would forgive her for what happened at Christmas, it might open the door for her to tell you where she's really hurting at and she might discover the love and grace of Jesus because of that. See, I wonder how many times there's just a little, he, the Holy Spirit speaks to us, Jesus speaks to us, just a little different. He adds a little bit on here, something we hadn't quite heard before. We don't think like that. Living water, he says. He, he does something a little different. I, I wonder if it's the whole idea that you're sitting here, and as soon as you saw somebody sitting across the room, the Lord inspired you to give them a certain amount of money, and you have the money on you tonight, and you're like, well, that's weird. I've never given a dime to anyone. Um, it was just a little add-on. He said, give that, and you're like, ooh, I've always kept that. What's he doing? I'm just telling you. Now, if, um, if it's me that you were inspired to give that money to, double that, okay? Trust you. Double your faith. Double your faith in Jesus. Nobody's catching my charismatic role there at all? Dang it. Okay. You know what I'm talking about, though, don't you? You have heard at times that it's just a little different than you've ever heard it before. He says living water. So verse uh, 11 and 12 here goes... She says, sir, what does she call him? Sir, she does not know him to be Jesus yet, the Messiah. Do you remember from John chapter five, uh, the, the man at the pool of Bethesda, what did he call Jesus to? The same thing, he said, sir. When he didn't know it was Jesus, the Messiah, he called him, he, he called him sir, she calls him sir. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well 
uh, is deep. Remember I told you about this. This is a deep well. It's a cold water well. And, and again, because the wells have to be deep because of the temperature uh, atmospherically there. But she immediately points out that he's got nothing to draw with. Like, um, I'm not letting you have my bucket. You, you didn't even come prepared for this, gentlemen. Sir, you didn't, you didn't even, you, you asking me for water and you didn't even come prepared. You didn't even bring your own uh, ladle, your own bucket. And she says, you have nothing to draw with. You didn't bring your own rope. You didn't bring your own bucket. You didn't come here prepared. And again, I wonder, back to you and I, if what he asked us to use is what we already have and that we use it for him. See, everything you need you already have right now on you that he wants to use. See, so often we say, well, I'll, I'll join the worship team, um, you know, when, when I kind of get this thing in my past right now. I'll, get, I'll teach a Sunday school class, um, you know, once I get more confident. I'll, I'll get involved with the hospitality team, you know, once I get past my divorce is fine. I'll, I'll get involved, um, you know, in the nursery once my kids get older. And Jesus says, and if you feel like he's asking you right now to do something like that, to use what you already have, then why are you making excuses about it? Why are you asking him? But you have nothing to draw. No, he doesn't need anything to draw water with. He has you. That's what he, Jesus is like saying. Um, mm, I don't need anything to draw water with. I'm, I'm God, he says. But I want to use what you have. He wants to use what you already have, folks. So many of us have discounted because we've been so socially separated for so long, it begins to bleed over into this emotional shamefulness psychologically where we don't think what we have is good enough. And we're not about to share it with anybody, let alone him. Why are you hoarding what he already gave to you in the first place? It's back to the whole tithing thing. I'm not going to do a whole tithing message for you tonight, but so many of us don't understand tithing. We think that the 100% is ours. 10% is his, folks. 10% is his. 90% is yours. Why are you hanging on to his 10%? You are hoarding what he gave to you so you could give back to him. He says to you, that's mine. Give it back. The 90 is yours. The 10 is his. See, we keep hanging on to it. Well, it is all his, yes. Good job. It's like the Holy Spirit's voice there, Randy. It was really weird for a moment there. I kept hearing, it's all his. It's all his. Where were you when my first charismatic moment was happening? You were missing that moment, my friend. It is all his. Isn't it beautiful that it's all his? 100% is all his. And all he requires is just the 10. <laughs> okay, let's move on. So she says in the second line, uh, where can you get this living water? Now she gets back around. She remembers he mentioned living water. Where can you get this living water? Now look at, do you see, watch, watch how crazy this lady is, okay? She says, you don't have any to draw with, and the well is deep. Then she says, where can you get this living water? And then she goes right back into her jargon that she's learned over years. She says, are you greater than our father Jacob, <laughs> who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his flocks and his herds? You see this woman vacillating? She connects with Jesus, and then she pulls away. She connects with him, and she pulls away. Same thing in our relationship with him. I want you to stay close to him. It's safest there. That's where he wants you to be. That's where you need to be. Why do you come in close and then pull back? She, she pushes away and says, you didn't bring anything to draw with, and the well is deep. And then she comes in close. Tell me about this living water. And then she pushes back. Are you greater than our father Jacob? And Because he's the one that gave us this well, and she kind of does this dissertation. We kind of mess with him. Do you understand? He will win every psychological battle you enter in with him. He's never lost a game of hide and seek in his life. <laughs> She's trying to run from him. Jesus answers, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. See, I wonder if we're drawing from the wrong well. I wonder if where you are drawing your strength from is the wrong well. I wonder if you're drawing your uh, inspiration is from the wrong well. I wonder if you're drawing your confidence is coming from the wrong well. I think a lot of us are drawing from the wrong wells. You understand what I'm talking about? What do, what do, you, what do you got to draw with? Jesus is like, don't worry about what I got to draw. I'm, I'm worried about what you have to draw with because you're drawn from the wrong well. You're, you're trying to go after water, and if you get this water you're looking for, you're going to be thirsty again, but I'm going to offer to you living water. You ought to get your confidence, your inspiration, your courage, your strength from him and him alone. I just prayed with somebody tonight, um, you know, I was looking at a medical report they got, um, and, and 
They're drawn from the wrong well. They're allowing themselves to go crazy thinking about what it might be. Let's just keep drawing from his well. Let's just keep, keep drawing, drawing from his strength, his confidence. Don't let the first report be the final report. Don't believe the lie, okay? Don't believe what you're saying in your head. Trust that he's got good things for you. Stay in him first, not in what the world is trying to offer you, not in what the devil's trying to lie to you about. Listen, where are you drawing from? Now, I know that is, that it, that is good speak, okay? And I'm not just telling it to you as a preacher. I'm telling you this as a friend. I'm telling you so I can watch the core online two days from now and remember I was speaking the same stuff because I gotta hear that. I gotta remember that I draw my strength from him. I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. It is not by might nor by strength, but by his spirit alone. He shall meet all of my needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. See, those are the things we stuff away down here. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. That's what I'm drawing from, okay? What I draw from? God's word. Okay, so he says to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Now, verse, the last two verses, 13 and 14. But whoever, I like whoever. I made whoever big on your sheet because I want you to know whoever. We're all included in that whoever. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst again. I love that. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What is the gift of God that he offers? He is the gift of God. He is the gift. But what's the gift that he gives? Eternal life. He offers to her something, again, she's never even heard of. I don't think she's heard of eternal life. In the Samaritan religions, there is no eternal life, okay? So first it's living water. Now he's offering to her eternal life. He is winning the words war with her right now. But I like it because it's a reminder to you and I that I'll ask you tonight, um, have you received the living water that he offers? I mean, have you received the living water he offers to you? He offers, offers to us life and life more abundant. Um, we've settled for just life. We ought to receive and life more abundant. Um, a lot of us have received uh, the little he has to offer. He, he has a lot more to offer. You ought to receive a lot more. He has living water. Have you received that? Have you received the power of the Holy Spirit? Have you allowed him to fully infuse your body and work through you, welling up, a spring welling up into eternal life? I, I like the action in, the, in, in that, a spring, there's an action word, of water, which implies movement, welling up, okay? We see three different times where there is this constant movement, there's this constant increase, there's this growth involved in getting to eternal life. That tells me this. Remember I told you last week, my greatest fear for the Christian church is this, we get saved and then we die. My greatest fear for Christians is we get saved and then we die. We get saved, we have, this, we have this powerful, emotional, spiritual, uh, physical, intellectual moment with him where, where we know he saves our soul and then we stop and we almost die there and we count on that moment. We go back to the date. You know, we say, you know, February 14th, uh, you know, 1981 is when I got saved. Do you know what? We just, um, we just went through the process of election for Board of Elders and even to just be interviewed for the Board of Elders, we have them fill out a piece of paper, and it's a questionnaire. And one of the questions we put on there was, tell us about your um, last spiritual, uh, or your last transformational spiritual experience this year. Because I don't want anybody leading this church. I don't want anybody involved in this church who's dead. You can die to yourself. And be alive in Christ. But I want to know what God's doing in your life because there is not a one of us uh, who, who can still be operating off what happened on February 14th, 1981. That's, uh, that's old milk. I want meat. So I'm telling you right now, you ought to be discovering something about him all the time. It ought to be welling up in you. There ought to be a, this work, the water flowing, a spring moving. And, and so the day you end up and you, you, you arrive in heaven, it's like the great old story. I don't want to just cross uh, home plate on, on, on a dinger that got over the fence, okay? Um, or somebody hit a triple and I was on third and I just got to trot in. I'd like to arrive in heaven as that guy always describes, I don't know which preacher always said, that you know you slid in and the knees are all skinned up and dirty because you was playing the game with everything you had. 
We ought to arrive as though that was the anticipation. We made it there, not by the skin of our teeth, but because we were, we were growing and we were moving and we were working. We were playing our little hearts out for him, growing and, and, and being invested and involved. That's what it really should be about. That's this, that's this spring of water welling up to eternal life. So when we arrive, it's not as though it's a, a foregone conclusion that we just expected it to happen. And it's not that we're trying to earn it by all these actions but it's that every day, man, I'm discovering something new about him. I'm glad he didn't give up on me. I'm glad that he didn't say, this is all the further you have to go, and then I'll give you part two when you get to heaven. You can keep learning and growing and experiencing and expressing nonstop. That ought to be our life. Again, I say to you, if we really grew passionately for Jesus Christ, if we really invested and believed in what he's talking about here, we'd freak people out at work, okay? We really would. They might even come to us and ask us to pray for them when they get bad medical news. We, we might scare our family members because they'd say, something's different about you, and it's a good different, instead of getting saved and just die. I'm gonna get saved and have transformational, powerful experiences over and over and over and over again. All brand new, all refreshing, all new. Now, I'm saying this to you in the midst of knowing I got an issue here and I had a growing issue here. But guess what? That's just life. That's just life. In the midst of it, I'm glad I'm identifying this and realizing this so I can get that fixed so I have another transformational experience that I can go back to and say, he saved me from that depression. He changed how I looked at anxiety. I understand now the brokenness in my heart. I don't have to be socially separate. My God is a good God because he does those kind of things all the time. That's what I want you to know. Okay, stop ranting and raving. Here it is. We're going to close strong. 822. Uh, Jesus said to her, water is not your problem. Water is not your problem. The real problem is what? You. <laughs> I, he didn't say that I said that, but I, I put Jesus said that. It just sounds more powerful uh, instead of taking credit for that one. Um, that's what he's saying. He's really saying to her that, that water's not your problem. You're here to draw water, and that's not your problem. The problem is you. And we're going to see uh, in the weeks to come how she continues this battle of words with him. She's going to get real theological with him in a moment here, okay? She's going to show him what she knows about God. She didn't even know she's talking to God. Um, I wonder what you would put in that first blank instead of water. See, because I wonder how many of us got, uh, um, we think we know what our problem is. But it's probably not that. Every one of our problems goes back to me and my inability to really let him be God. Yours too, by the way. Let him be God. Let him reign and rule in your life. Let him have every nook and cranny of you. The woman said to him, verse 15, we're going to wrap up. Sir, give me this water. Again, she says, sir, I like it. <laughs> I like when you're, when, you're, when you're talking to the guy that owns the place and you think he's an employee. You know, that's that moment when you know you're like, you know. You know, can I talk to a manager? I am the manager. Well, can I talk to the owner? Matter of fact, I am the owner. That's what, this is what's going to happen to her. She's going to have that moment when she realizes, he's the owner. <laughs> Sir, she says again for the same, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Um, I, this may be, again, I know I say this about every scripture, maybe one of my favorite scriptures because the bottom line you can fill in is a blank is I don't ever want to come back here again, 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 she says, give me this water so I won't have to keep coming here. Isn't this interesting? It takes 15 verses for her to get to the place where she confesses that something's wrong. Did you catch that? She is going out, it tells us in verse five, she's going out there to draw water at noon outside the city gates at a well made for animals and she runs into this guy um, she's debated with him now in two different fields, trying to avoid the obvious, and it gets to verse 15, and she finally identifies, G give me what you're talking about so I don't ever have to come back here again. Because she doesn't like being socially separate. I promise you tonight, if you are socially separate, you don't like it either. You know it's not working for you. And if you could get it fixed so you never have to come back here again, can you imagine? I wonder how many of you are sitting here and you have psychological shame. Your mind races with issues of shame. You understand what shame is? Shame says, I am bad. Guilt says, I have done bad. See the difference? Shame, and we'll talk about this. Shame says, 
I am wrong. Guilt says, I done something wrong. The difference is there. When we internalize it, that's what, I wonder how many of us are sitting here with shame in our lives. You think you're responsible for something. You are not responsible. That is not who you are, and it's not who he created you to be. You are not a loser. You do not have to be lonely. You are not somebody who is broken. You are not somebody who is missing something. You are not, don't let the shame, and I wonder how many of us are sitting here tonight where there's, we're spiritually sinful. There's some sinful issues in our life. We gotta break and destroy the destructive cycle. And the only way that happens is by getting to him, and she's ready to do that. She says, I never want to come back here again. Okay, any, uh, any final closing questions or thoughts that you guys might have? Thanks for joining us at The Core at Westside Community Church. The Core meets on Wednesday nights at Westside at 7 p.m. We hope to see you there. <laughs>